Hi again, this is my 8th Kiwi Crash Course video. At this point, as I mentioned last time, I think I really have covered all the Kiwi basics. Only fairly quickly in each video, and of course there's plenty more I can talk about, but we really have moved to the basics of the Kiwi widget trees, the Kiwi language, the event and property system, and more recently the graphical instructions on Kiwi's canvas. Of course I'm not going to stop here, there's plenty more to cover, and I'll also try to move on to different programs addressing real world problems you might have, rather than just developing this toy program. I have plenty of ideas, but please feel free to leave a comment if you have any suggestions or things you'd like to see. First of all though, I want to wrap up this program for now by fixing some bugs. Nothing major, but actually there are a couple of places where the program doesn't quite work how I really want it to, which you might have noticed if you've been following along. As usual, this is the same program and code from last time, and there will be a downloadable version in the video description if you want to follow along. So the first problem I have is the initial position of our scattered label. I'll just start the program again to see. So you can see, although we can drag this around, when the program first runs, it starts off in the bottom left corner, and the text actually overflows the screen. I prefer the label to start somewhere in the middle of the screen, but I also want to fully understand why the text overflows, even though the label widget itself should be in the default start position of the exact bottom left of the screen. I usually find a useful way to understand widget position is to make some simple graphics instructions exactly where the widgets are, so I can see exactly where Kiwi knows the uh, actual position and size of the widget are. In this case, for our label, we can add the canvas as last time. We set a simple colour. Let's make it RGBA. Uh, let's make it, say, green. And half opacity, say. Actually, let's also get rid of the blue background so it doesn't interfere. And we can draw a rectangle. Again, as last time, its position is the position of the label, and its size is the position of is the size of the label. And now, if we're in the program again, there we are. Everything's the same as before, except I've got rid of the blue background. And now, our moving label has a green rectangle exactly where the label widget is. This immediately makes it clear what's going on. The text, for whatever reason, is not constrained to fit within the label. In fact, this is normal Kiwi behaviour. The reason is that sometimes it's exactly what you want, depending on how the label is positioned. Sometimes you want to have the label be the same size as the text, which we want here. But other times you might want exactly the opposite, to have the text constrained to fit within the label, say to change the paragraph wrapping depending on the size of the text box. In our case, we want to go back to Kiwi language and tell the label size to be the same size as its containing text. That means the label will still fit in the bottom left of the window when the program starts. But if we make the label bigger so it fits the text in, the text will not overflow the window. Let's go back to Kiwi language. The key here is that the label size can be bound to the label's texture size. This property, and this is a Kiwi property, so it will automatically update when the texture size updates, uh, represents the exact size of the actual text within the label. That is, the text is rendered onto kind of an image, and the size of that image is what we're using here. Uh, it's a very minor change. Let's go back to Kiwi language. And that's it. Just by telling the label that its size should track its contained text size, it still appears in the bottom left, but now the text fits within it and it doesn't overlap the screen. That's a good start. Uh, we can even update things here. And you can see the size of the label, uh, shown by the size of the green background, updates as I change the text. The second thing I said I wanted to do was have the label start in the center of the screen. I still want to do that. But first I have to fix another bug that uh, I haven't pointed out at all so far. That's that I don't have to click on the label to move it. I can click up here or over here, and I can't click below or uh, to the left of it, but I can click to the top right. So what's going on there? Why is the draggable area much larger than the label itself? This comes back around to the scatter. So let's draw the scatter. Again, standard technique, which is to draw a picture to show exactly where the scatter is so we can understand why we're clicking on it even though we're not clicking on the label. We've drawn its canvas, we set its colour. Let's draw, I don't know, uh, a red background for this one. One more, more. and again, 0.5, I guess. And a rectangle whose size is the size of the scatter and whose position is the position of the scatter. Actually, I also have to draw on the scatter's canvas.after. This is important because the way the scatter actually handles rotation, translation, and scaling is by modifying its canvas and then also modifying the touch input to map back to where it would have been had the scatter not been transformed. That doesn't matter to us here. We can avoid it just by drawing a canvas.after. It's after all that manipulation canvas does, 
So it will mean that our colour and our rectangle will be unaffected by any previous constructions within the scatter. Uh, you can change it if you want yourself to see what would have happened if I hadn't set canvas up after. But now we can see this red background shows us where the scatter is, and it's clearly a great deal larger than the label. Uh, in fact, suspiciously, it's exactly the same size as the float layout. If you remember, the top of our program is a text input, then there's a float layout that we're dragging the scatter around in. And at the bottom is this box layout with these two labels we had in a video or two ago. The problem here is that apparently the scatter size is exactly the same as this float layout size. We've seen the reason for this before. It's the same reason that if you want to set a manual, say, height for this text input at the top, we had to first set its size hint to none. That's because the default size hint is 1, and the float layout sees that and says, OK, I'll automatically set your size to be the same size as me. So the scatter's size hint starts off as 1, 1, and that's what the float layout is seeing. And because it's a layout, it's automatically recognizing that and using it to size the scatter. We solve this problem by simply setting the size hint of the scatter to none and none, that is none in the x direction and none in the y direction, which simply tells the float layout, no, don't resize the scatter, let it set its own size. We can also size it manually to be the same size as the label, my label dot size, which will mean that uh, the scatter and the touchable area tracks exactly the touch area of the label itself, which means we can click only on the label and not outside it if we want to move it. Let's see that in action. So there we go. Now you can see both the label and the scatter still have a background drawn, but now they're both in exactly the same place. I can't drag the label around outside the label, uh, only scale it inside. What we see here is a kind of an implementation detail of the scatter. The red background is exactly where the scatter widget really is, but the green background is where the transformed label is after we've done some scaling and some rotation. The way scatter works is when I click, it maps the position here back onto the position it would have been in the original scatter. It's totally transparent to us, we don't have to care about it, but it's interesting that we can see that behavior here. Um, again, we can only see that because I drew on the canvas after rather than the interior canvas of the scatter, which will be subject to the normal transformations. So, the last thing I said is I want the label to appear in the center of the screen. We can do that now because the scatter is the right size, but at the moment, everything is defaulting to the default position of zero, zero, that is the bottom left of the screen even though the float layout itself is over here. So, again, a normal kind of change. What you want to do is set the scatter's position to be the same as the float layout position in some sense. In fact, key widgets all have a center property, which is exactly what we want. And in this case, you can refer to the scatter's parent, self.parent.center. I'm not sure if I've mentioned before, but every widget has this parent property, and if it does have a parent widget, in this case the float layout, it will always refer to that widget. As this is Kiwi language, that means the scatter has a binding created so that its center will always track the parent center. Uh, it seems to be exactly what we want. Instead of defaulting to the bottom left, this center property will modify the position and have it appear in the center of the float layout as we desire. And there we go. As expected, the scatter is automatically placed in the center of the float layout. Because we used Kiwi language, there is actually a little side effect here. If you move the scatter and then resize the window slightly, it jumps back to be in the center of the screen. That's because Kiwi language automatically made a binding so that the scatter position would track the float layout center position. If you don't want that, you can still avoid it. You could create, you could set the center property in Python instead. You can see how to do that in the previous videos. And that would not create a binding and only do it once. Uh, it's not very important to us here, so using Kiwi language is fine. So there we are. None of these changes were very major, just a few kind of small bug fixes. But I hope it's been useful to walk through a few of these quirks and understand how you can use these same ideas and processes to fix unintended behavior in your own apps. One of the most important things, I think, is that it really is very useful to draw simple graphics instructions to see exactly where your widgets are uh, and how they're being transformed. That makes it, for instance, in this case, very obvious exactly what was wrong with the scatter. We could see that it really wasn't the size we wanted it to be, uh, which immediately pointed us to the fact that probably we wanted to look at its size hint because we've seen before, the size hint affects how layouts change the size of their children. So that's it for now. I haven't completely decided what I do next time, but one idea is to walk through the creation of a scrollable label widget, which would cover some more behavior of the label. Uh, we saw a little bit this time, but I cover it in more detail. As well as it would hopefully be useful to anyone wanting to create their own more complex widgets out of key widget components. That's just an idea. If you have any ideas or suggestions, as I said before, please do comment in the video. Uh, I'm happy to add them to the list. But for now, thank you for watching.